Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily, what to expect for the upcoming trial for former Theranos CEO Elizabeth Holmes. The questions potential jurors will be asked about the alleged multi-million dollars in fraud. And longtime friend of Robert Durst is back on the stand. How the hostile witness is responding to questions as the real estate heir has problems with his hearing in court. If they ask, you won't need it. Plus, jury selection is underway in Colorado for the trial of a father accused of murdering his own son. Why Dylan Redwine's mother is still in shock over the loss of her 13-year-old. I just didn't think Mark had that in him. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Over the next month, a jury will decide whether there's enough evidence to prove a Colorado man murdered his son, Dylan Redwine. Law and Crime's Angela Levy spoke with Dylan's mother and tells us what helped with the investigation. Yeah, Brian, opening statements are expected in Mark Redwine's trial early next week. Dylan Redwine's mother has been waiting nearly nine years for some level of accountability in her son's murder. Just got to check you, okay, Mark? July 2017, police put Mark Redwine in handcuffs on the ground as he's taken into custody for the murder of his son, Dylan, years prior. They say that they had a, uh, a warrant for murder second for you. I'm sorry? I have no idea what that's about. Dylan vanished over Thanksgiving weekend in 2012. He was on a court-ordered visit with his father. Unfortunately, he was forced to go because of the judge's decision. Um, in retrospect, I never would have put him on that plane, obviously, if I would have known then what I know now. Elaine Hall is Dylan's mother. Dylan was last seen on a surveillance photo from a Walmart with his father. The community searched tirelessly for Dylan. Elaine Hall said Mark Redwine was conspicuously absent. He wasn't active in anything over the months that we searched for Dylan. He wouldn't talk to anybody. He was um, very evasive. You know, he acted like nothing was wrong. In 2013, Elaine Hall and Mark Redwine appeared on Dr. Phil. Mark Redwine said this about his son's disappearance. I didn't lose Dylan, Elaine. How, then why is he gone? Well, that you know, that's a question we all have to ask, but nobody's no, you got have the answer. To ask Prosecutors say Dylan's blood was found in his father's home. His remains found less than 10 miles away. Evidence from cadaver dogs will be presented at trial. Uh, to the role of the cadaver dogs, um, you know, we, we feel that that was a critical part of the investigation as well. Um, the cadaver dogs um, present strong evidence um, placing a cadaver in Mr. Redwine's home um, and cadaver scent on his clothing as well as cadaver scent in his truck. Prospective jurors are being told part of the evidence in the case involves red wine engaged in an act with fecal matter, which isn't illegal, but may be offensive to some. Over a year prior to November 2012, Dylan found several compromising personal photographs of his father on his father's computer. No one has ever seen or heard Dylan confront his father with these photographs. Dylan's family simply wants answers. I'd like to hear the truth. I, I wish the truth would come out. And prosecutors claimed in the indictment that Dylan may have been planning to confront his father over the photos of him dressed as a woman and involved in some type of activity with fecal matter. I asked Elaine Hall about whether or not her husband, her ex-husband now, had ever dressed as a woman or done anything else like that. And she said she was not aware of any such thing during their marriage. Brian? Thanks, Anjanette. Joining us today is civil rights attorney Katie Smith and Terry Austin. Katie, blood, cadaver dogs, and a child's remains found miles from the father's home. What kind of defense could be raised here? Well, Brian, it's tough. The facts seem to be very difficult in terms of analyzing it from the defense's perspective. But the defense attorney's best friend is always the burden of proof. Remember, it's the prosecution that bears the heavy burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt. And while they don't have to prove motive, motive is always very important. But the defense needs to be careful because this motive that they're mounting is a slippery slope. And you don't want to get into too many damaging factual details that might move the jury to dislike the defendant. So this is going to be a tough one. And we want to watch out to see what angle they choose. Makes sense. Terry, jury questionnaires often give us an insight into a trial. What do you expect from this case based on the questions? 
Well, I think that the insight is it's going to be a very interesting case. It was a very short questionnaire. It had standard questions like, have you ever been the victim of a crime? But one of the questions said, you might see a photograph that has fecal matter in it. And if that is introduced, you will be told that it cannot go to the defendant's character and whether or not the jury can actually follow those instructions. In my opinion, Brian, that cannot be erased from a juror's mind. And I think that the judge should have already decided whether that's going to come in or not come in because it will be prejudicial. And I don't think it's that probative unless they really can show it went to intent. I mean, when they show it at trial, I don't think it's gonna be able to go from my mind when we see it, but we'll see. And Jeanette, what else has Mark Redwine said in the past about Dylan's disappearance? You know, he has always denied any involvement in his son's disappearance. And back on that Dr. Phil episode that we showed you from 2013, he suggested that somehow Dylan may have been abducted. Apparently, Dylan was supposed to go to a friend's home later that day. He also mentioned something about a mailman seeing Dylan later that day after he had gone to work. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what the defense says at trial. If anything, if, as we know, they don't have to put on a case. Yeah. We'll see how this plays out. Thank you, everyone. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, the upcoming trial for former Theranos CEO Elizabeth Holmes. Why more than 100 questions for potential jurors are being scrapped. But first, millionaire real estate heir Robert Durst has a new look as an old friend takes the witness stand. See that and more fireworks between the lawyers next. Welcome back. One of Robert Durr's friends is back on the witness stand after a delay in court due to a health incident involving the millionaire real estate heir. Robert Durr appeared in court on Wednesday with a shaved head. The scar from when the doctors inserted a shunt into his head in 2017 was visible along with his catheter. Durst is accused of murdering his best friend Susan Berman in December 2000. Prosecutors say Durst believed Berman threatened to go to the authorities with information about Durst's missing wife, Kathy. The defendant's friend, Doug Oliver, began testifying last week and was declared a hostile witness for the state. The direct line of questioning was paused because Durst was hospitalized. On Wednesday, Oliver continued to deny he ever made the comment that Kathy Durst was sold into white slavery. Have you at times said, Mr. Oliver, that if you said it, you said it because you were trying to be, quote, funny, unquote? Yes, I believe I said that. So can you tell me what would be funny about that? I'm sorry? Can you explain what would be funny? There's about, nothing's funny about it. Well, so Mr. Oliver, when you said, if you said it, you were trying to be funny, can you explain what you would have meant by that? I can't explain what I meant by it. Would you agree that that would be an inappropriate and uncooperative comment? I, no. Can you explain then if your, let me back up, is your position that you believe that Kathy Durst was sold into white slavery because of a cocaine problem? No. Where did you even come up with that comment? I believe that the officer offered me up certain possibilities, and I think now that I refresh my memory, that that was one of the many he <coughs> um, offered up. Court then took another short break due to an issue with the defendant's hearing aids. You can hear them beeping in the background. Yeah, it's, I guess like your alarm in your uh, smoke alarm. It always goes off at like 2 a.m. and you have to uh, <laughs> take it down and change the batteries at an inopportune moment. So I think that may be what we're grappling with. Then prosecutor John Lewin played a recorded phone call between Oliver and the defendant in jail. On the call, Oliver says he's upset about another of Dirt's friends telling authorities that the defendant admitted to murdering Berman. And talking about the trial, the thing that really upset me is Nick. I just can't believe that guy. Say that again. Now the thing that really upset me about this, the little I know about what's going on is Nick. I just can't believe Nick. You know? 
he did what he did, that's all. Who did what? Who did? Nick, remember Nick Chapin? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it, it, that, that really upset me, Bob. It upset me for you. We lost the, the next two lines are Mr. Durr says, yeah, well, it upset me too, and then you say, you know, as a friend. You've had a chance to review that previously, correct, Mr. Oliver? I just read it. And isn't it true, Mr. Oliver, that what you meant by this statement is that you were voicing your disapproval, your disapproval with Nick Chavin for having communicated Bob's confession to investigators? Uh, yes. Back with us is civil rights attorney Katie Smith and Terry Austin. Terry, more fireworks as Oliver testified. Lewin seemed in control of the court, but he seemed to struggle to get Oliver to admit to opinion questions. What do you think? Well, I think you're right, Brian. There were more fireworks indeed. I mean, he wasted a lot of time trying to talk about opinion questions, and he wasted a lot of time talking about small points. I know he wants to establish that Oliver was biased and he would do anything for Durst, but he actually, as we just saw, that question about Kathy being sold into white slavery because of a cocaine problem. He talked about that cocaine problem and the white slavery issue, and was it funny? For the longest amount of time. Actually, I do think that the judge did well today, that he tried to pull Lewin in. He told Lewin on more than one occasion, look, you've made your point, move on now. And so I think it might be a little late to do that, but he is at least trying to rein Lewin in a little bit and not let him take over the entire court. Katie, to Terry's point, there's a lot of bickering back and forth, but the judge seems to sometimes look to Lewin for case law. How do you think the jury is viewing all of this? You know, juries tend to really get tired of that very quickly. The inner play between the judges and the attorneys tends to waste the jurors' time. At least I know I've spoken to jurors and they say that. So I don't think that they credit that too much. And oftentimes they tend to glaze out because really that stuff they're going to be later told. They can't even consider when they're considering evidence in the case. So I think that there tends to be a level of fatigue that the jurors feel about that type of behavior. Yeah, and this is going to be quite the long case as expected to last months. So we'll see how that fatigue or if that fatigue settles in over time. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, the defense gets their turn to question Doug Oliver. Plus, the trial of Theranos CEO Elizabeth Holmes is coming up. Why her defense attorney is calling a judge's changes to a potential jury questionnaire disastrous. Welcome back. Defense attorney for Robert Durst had the opportunity to ask his longtime friend questions, but it didn't exactly begin as planned. May I ask if we've got the clip that I want to play, Your Honor? Yes. Your Honor, I would just request that when Mr. DeGuerin wants to take Mr. Oliver on as his own witness, as he has indicated to me before he wants to do, that he let court and counsel know that at this point in time he's taking him on as his own witness, as that will change the dynamic. Just a minute. I have a right to cross-examine. That's not and what I... You don't, actually. Well, then talk about it. I don't have a right to cross-examine a witness? You have the right to examine the witness, but you may not need. Then the defense asked Doug Oliver more about the defendant's friend who allegedly heard Durst confess to the murder of Susan Berman. Did you say that you'd tell Mr. Lewin in the same conversation that he just referred to that you didn't think that Nick Chavin was truthful? Yes. In fact, did you say several times that you couldn't believe what Nick said? Yes. Meaning that you couldn't believe Nick because he's not credible? Yes. You know Nick Chavin, or knew Nick Chavin, didn't you? Yes. Do you have an opinion about whether he's a truthful person? I, I thought he had a tendency to exaggerate things. In fact, did you, have you told Mr. Lewin and told others that you thought Nick was hanging around Bob just for the money? I did say that. You know, these were a series of leading questions. I'm just, the court had said, I haven't objected yet, but... Fine, court, thank you. 
That's one of those speaking non-objections. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, what do I do? It's not, object it's not a speaking objection. No, thank you. Back with us is civil rights attorney Katie Smith and co-host Terry Austin. Terry, the defense seems shocked, as was I, even after researching uh, the rule that the court put out there. Uh, did the defense's unfamiliarity, unfamiliarity sorry, with Cali law affect the questioning? Listen, there's no question that Lewin knows California law better than DeGurn and even better than the judge. And the judge said that. He says, listen, you might know the law better than I do. But on this point, I think DeGurn had a good point. He wanted to do his cross-examination, and he wanted to do leading questions. But there had been a motion about that, and I think that Lewin was correct. The judge had already ruled that because Oliver was designated as a hostile witness for the prosecution, when it goes back and the defense is asking questions, at that point, he cannot cross and lead the witness because he's really a friendly witness for the defense. So it made sense, even though it's something that we're not accustomed to seeing. And I have to give Lewin credit for knowing the details and the ins and outs of the California law. Yeah, it's got to be one of those Cali laws that doesn't make sense to us New York attorneys because that would just make it that, I don't know, you maybe don't cross-examine anyone because all the witnesses are hostile for the prosecution, but we'll see. Let's be honest, Katie. Oliver isn't giving up his friends, though, so does it really matter what he says on cross, or did the defense get something out of him that helped? Well, Brian, there were a few good nuggets on their face, right? The stuff that he said about Shaven I thought were particularly helpful, but the jury immediately, like most of us, will decide whether or not we think that this person is biased. And so if someone is a longtime friend, like Oliver is, we tend to look at the, that testimony with a grain of salt, because obviously he doesn't want to give up his friend, and he might be saying whatever he can to help his friend out. So I think it really dep depends on what the jury decides about that very issue, um, about whether or not they're going to even credit the stuff that he said. Absolutely. Makes sense. Thank you both. When we come back, fraud, lies, and misrepresentations. The charges against former CEO Elizabeth Holmes and her attorney's concerns about finding unbiased jurors. Welcome back. Tensions are heating up as the trial for the former CEO of Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes, nears. Holmes is accused of defrauding investors of millions and scamming doctors and patients. What do you dream for? That less people have to say goodbye too soon to people they love. That was Elizabeth Holmes in an HBO documentary talking about Theranos, the company she founded in 2003. It was promoted as a way to revolutionize medical lab testing, but federal prosecutors say it was a scam. A grand jury indicted Holmes and Theranos COO Ramesh Sani Balwani in 2018 on 11 charges of wire fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. They're both pleading not guilty, and Holmes is slated to go to trial first on August 31st. At a hearing on Tuesday, the judge granted Holmes permission to nurse her newborn child during breaks in court. Now attorneys are taking aim with a proposed jury questionnaire. The 46-page document asks prospective jurors about their news habits and if they follow any of more than a dozen journalists, including law and crime investigative reporter Adam Klasfeld. They're also asked if they've seen any of the eight specials on Holmes, including The Inventor, Out for Blood in Silicon Valley. You all are part of something that is going to change our world. What higher purpose is there? Elizabeth came to me and she described her idea. It's impossible, physically. The company claimed it would transform blood testing using a few drops of blood in a so-called nanotainer. Holmes' trial has been delayed numerous times because of the pandemic and her pregnancy. It's scheduled to last 13 weeks, but the judge is warning prospective jurors it could last longer. Katie, major trials in the media, at least I think, are here to stay. Are these questioners too long, as the prosecution argues, or just a reflection of the times? Brian, you have to always strike that balance, right? Because you don't want people who've consumed too much media around these specific issues. So, for example, I think whether people have watched the HBO specials and already made up their minds about this case, that would be important to ask. But whether you're essentially asking people in this in this questionnaire whether they've consumed really any type of media, it's extremely broad, and you're allowing 
either side to really try to exclude people that they want dismissed on cause instead of using peremptory challenges, which is a really big deal when you're doing jury selection. So I think this goes a little far, and we need to be very judicious in how we use these questionnaires. Yeah, definitely interesting to see how that judge finds that balance, maybe scaling back a little from what the defense is asking. Terry, our very own Adam Klaus held his name in the questionnaire as someone the defense wants to know if the jurors have listened to. Uh, are there any other questions that jumped out at you? You know, it's interesting. They did ask questions about whether or not the jurors were on medication, whether or not they'd ever posted on social media. But I think the part about the questionnaire that the defense made and made so long was repetitive questions, argumentative questions, but they were mostly about the media. And I think the prosecution thought to themselves, well, this is just too much and this should not be allowed. And the judge actually did cut back a little bit and said that because it was so repetitive, we're not going to allow this. So I definitely think that you have to get into the details of a case. I think you have to make sure that the jurors are going to be fair. They're not going to be biased. But I think jurors can't be asked over and over specifics about the name of particular publications. And to your point, the name of particular artists or you know writers who are working in those publications. Because, frankly, jurors aren't going to remember that kind of detail anyway. And that is actually one of the arguments that the prosecution made, that they have read these articles, but they're not going to remember all of those details anyway. Now, Terry, quick question. Could this all be solved by changing venue, maybe a different state? I think everybody's heard about this, but particularly California. So maybe. Who knows if it could help? All right. We'll see. Thanks for joining us here at Long Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.